Normally, I like to start off these videos with some kind of joke, a terrible pun or some ridiculous anecdote so it's not completely dry all the way through. However, given that today's video covers the joyful topic of lung cancer, I fail to think of anything that would not be both insensitive and get me yeeted off this platform faster than a clown at a cholerophobia meeting. So, before we start, please enjoy this short clip of a red panda eating grapes. Paraneoplastic syndrome refers to a collective group of disorders that trigger as a side effect of many types of cancers. The immune system has an abnormal response to the cancerous growths known as a neoplasm. It is believed that this phenomenon happens when the body's T cells mistakenly attack the body's nervous system. It's an important distinction to make that these neoplasms are not caused by the cancer itself, but instead occur alongside via immune system activation. These neoplasms can occur alongside quite literally any cancer, although it is typically seen more frequently in those with lung, ovary, breast, and lymphatic cancer. Between 8 to 20% of people with cancer will develop paraneoplastic syndromes, depending on the type of cancer at hand. Of those who do develop paraneoplastic features, about 60% of the time, these features are noticed before a cancer diagnosis is made. It's important to get this distinction the right way round. Just because X comes before Y does not mean X is caused by Y, or post hoc ergo propter hoc for you logic nerds out there. But simply, if you have cancer, it is actually quite unlikely that you will experience any kind of paraneoplastic syndrome, as less than 1 in 5 do. However, if you have signs of paraneoplastic features, unless it has been mistaken for a different illness, you will have cancer. This can be a blessing in disguise, however, as these features serve as early diagnostic tools and allow clinicians to catch cancer in its early stages, where treatment is much more likely to be successful. Today, we are going to be focusing specifically on the lower respiratory tract. When we talk about lung carcinomas, there are two main groups to be aware of, small cell lung carcinoma and non-small cell lung carcinoma. Inventive, I know. Small cell lung carcinoma can be broken down into oat cell carcinoma and combined small cell carcinoma. For this video, we will be grouping the two, although I wanted to mention that for your own research and so you can't blame me when asked if you don't know. For non-small cell, there are three subgroups, which we'll be delving into deeper. These are adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and large cell carcinoma. I have now said carcinoma so much, it has lost all meaning. Adenocarcinoma is the most common, accounting for approximately 40% of all lung carcinoma diagnosis. Squamous is second, at 30%, whilst both large and small cell occupy 15% each. So let's delve into each one of these and what we should be looking out for. Small cell lung carcinoma is so named because of its histological appearance as we can see here. We have cells with nuclear molding, minimal amount of cytoplasm and stipled chromatin. It is tightly linked with tobacco smoke and is very rare in non-smokers with less than 3% of diagnosis in those who have never smoked. Whilst it makes up less than 15% of lung carcinomas as a whole, it is a very aggressive form of cancer that often goes undiagnosed until it is more advanced. 10 year survival rate is only 3.5%, so catching key features is incredibly important. A common feature here is Lambert-Eaton syndrome, a condition where the body's immune system attacks the neuromuscular junctions, the areas where your nerves and muscles connect. Around half of patients will experience this as part of an autoimmune disorder alone, whilst the other half will experience it alongside small cell lung carcinoma. If an individual is over 50 years of age especially, then cancer is highly likely. 
The damage to the neuromuscular junctions leads to muscle weakness, difficulty walking, tingling sensations over the body, dry mouth, and general fatigue. Another common feature is known as syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, or SIADH for short. Antidiuretic hormones are produced by the hypothalamus and help the kidneys to control the amount of water your body loses through urine. Electrolytes, like sodium, begin to fall as a result of water retention. This in turn can lead to cramping, nausea, and vomiting. In severe cases, confusion, seizures, and comas can occur. In a small percentage, typically less than 5%, an increase in adrenocortotrophic hormone, or ACTH, can occur. ACTH is responsible for the production of cortisol, an overexpression of which can lead to Cushing syndrome, it results in weight gain. Fat tends to accumulate around the chest and abdominal region, but slims around the arms and legs. The face becomes round, red, and puffy. A buildup of fat on the back of the neck and shoulders can occur. This is commonly referred to as a buffalo hump, although is more associated with steroid use and less common when seen alongside cancer. Other symptoms include hypertension, high blood pressure, hyperglycemia, high blood glucose levels, hypokalemia, low blood potassium levels, and alkalosis, where the body's pH level is raised. Surgery has been scarcely used since the 70s for this type of cancer. Research has shown it to be either completely ineffective or to be so minimally effective that the associated risks of surgery are not justified in the minimal likelihood of improving prognosis. Instead, treatments involving chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or a combination of the two are the preferred method. For the non-small cell cancers, I think it is helpful to think of them at their usual site of origin. Adenocarcinomas usually begin in the outer regions of the lung beginning in glands at the alveoli. Squamous cell carcinoma begins, unsurprisingly, in the squamous cells that line the inside of the airways in the lungs. This cancer usually starts more centrally and in the bronchi. Large cell carcinoma can form in various large epithelial cells throughout the lungs, although is most common in the outer regions of them. Large cell is typically the fastest growing, and as such, as the worst prognosis of the free. Lung adenocarcinoma starts in the cells that would normally produce mucus, type 2 epithelial cells. It is the most common form of lung cancer amongst non-smokers, although still disproportionately affects smokers. A common paraneoplastic syndrome of this is known as hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, or HPOA, which leads to a trio of conditions. These are periostitis, digital clubbing, and painful arthropathy. Periostitis is caused by inflammation of the periosteum, a layer of connective tissue that surrounds bone. This is common in athletes, especially runners, and this is marked by tenderness and swelling of the bone as well as an aching pain. In this instance, it mainly affects the small hand joints. Digital clubbing is a deformity which affects the fingers, resulting in the distorted angle of the nail bed. It's not just cancer, but an array of respiratory and cardiovascular diseases which can cause it. Clubbing is one of the oldest diagnostic examinations, with reports dating as far back as Hippocrates himself. Arthropathy is probably one you are aware of, as it is more commonly referred to as arthritis and causes pain and inflammation in the joints. These three factors combine to make up hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, which can occur alone, but is most associated with adenocarcinoma. It can also occur with small cell carcinoma, although this is much less likely. Unfortunately, the body tends not to play by clearly defined rules, and there is some level of overlap 
between different prognosis. A less common paraneoplastic feature here is that of gynecomastia, a condition which leads to an increase in the amount of breast gland tissue. This is caused by an imbalance of the hormones estrogen and testosterone. If you have ever seen the movie Fight Club, then you will likely remember Bob, played by the late and great Meatloaf. Bob is described as being a bodybuilder and steroid user, overuse of which increases testosterone. When the body produces too much testosterone, some of it is converted to estrogen. In the case of Bob, he also suffered from testicular cancer. He was forced to have his testicles removed, resulting in gynecomastia. A link between lung adenocarcinoma is known, but not fully understood. Whilst it is a feature of lung cancer, it tends to be more indicative of breast and testicular cancer, as well as a feature in some non-natural bodybuilders. Squamous cell carcinoma is often a centrally located tumour close to the helum. Histological hallmarks are polygonal cells with intercellular bridges and crisp eosinophilic cytoplasm. Tumours may also contain keratin pearls and larger tumours may have extensive necrosis. As we discussed earlier, clubbing is a common feature of many respiratory diseases and can also occur as part of squamous cell carcinoma with or without the presence of hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy. A feature to look out for is that of parathyroid hormone-related protein secretions. This is a hormone normally secreted by mesenchymal stem cells, but can also be secreted by cancer cells. This hormone has an important function in regulating the calcium blood levels. This regulation leads to hypercalcemia and is usually associated with overactive parathyroid glands. Too much calcium in your blood can weaken your bones, create kidney stones, and interfere with how your heart and brain function. Another hormone that can be interfered with is thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH. As the name implies, this hormone stimulates the thyroid gland, which in turn can lead to hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism can lead to a wide array of symptoms. A lump at the front of the throat caused by thyroid swelling is quite common and termed a goiter. Other symptoms include hair loss, weight gain, lethargy, and poor memory. Finally, we come to large cell carcinoma. Histologically, this consists of sheets and nests of large cells with vesicular nuclei, prominent nucleoli, and moderate or abundant amounts of cytoplasm. Because it typically develops in the outer periphery of the lungs, symptoms tend not to appear until it has already spread. For those at risk, smokers, and those who work with carcinogenic chemicals, annual screenings are highly advised. Failure to catch it in its early stages is why it is the most lethal of the non-small cell carcinomas, and also why it tends not to be as closely linked to specific paraneoplastic syndromes as the other forms of lung cancer. Conditions such as gynecomastia Cushing syndrome and SIADH can occur, but tend to be more atypical. Pleural effusion can occur, a condition in which fluid accumulates in the pleural cavity. This results in dyspnea, or shortness of breath, and chest pain, especially when breathing. Fatigue, as well as aches and pains in the upper chest, back, and shoulders are common. As the disease progresses, a chronic cough as well as hemoptysis, coughing up of blood is common. To bring all of this together, lung cancer can be broadly categorized into either small cell or non-small cell lung carcinoma, SCLC or NSCLC respectively. There are four main groups in total. Adenocarcinoma is the most common and has the largest incidence of non-smokers. Common symptoms are hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy and gynecomastia. Squamous cell usually begins in the bronchi and can lead to hypercalcemia 
and hyperthyroidism. Large cell carcinoma is aggressive and rarely caught before it spreads. Small cell is the most lethal and almost predominantly affects smokers. Paraneoplastic features include inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, Lambert-Eaton syndrome and Cushing syndrome. That's all from me. Thank you very much for watching.